friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where we are connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Speaking of which, we've got quite a globally known figure here as the guest today. Can you roll a crit? Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for the minor shout out yes, in one of your YouTube videos recently. <laughs> well, the only people who would get that are games developers. But no, 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 it's, it's fine. I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah. You know, this week we're going to have a slightly more competitive podcast, considering that Can You Roll a Crit is the internet's uh, resident sweat lord in the UK. Yeah. Or at least one of them. For a hidden sweat lord or former sweat lord. And it sounds like you're going to be picking up TOing soon. So we wanted to hop on a call and, you know, talk a little bit about what makes the UK scene great and what makes our game great. Yeah, cool. And, you know, fun fact, a big reason why I ended up in the TO space is when the game first came out, I read a lot of your articles about Warhammer World and the cool setups. And I was like, I could do that. So without you, I wouldn't have done the original tournaments that kind of kicked off the Brooklyn scene. And eventually oh. got me and Jason to meet. And so now, what you're now saying, we've come full circle. I'm the father of this podcast and of the New York scene. You're like the grandfather. <laughs> it's gonna annoy some a lot more people. scenes than just that. <laughs> yeah, Maybe. Probably. Don't give me all that responsibility. That's... Yeah, I just Can't wanted to you know, kick it off with a you know a more casual question like what a What's been going on for you guys recently? You know, outside of just pure kill team stuff. Any good movies? Anyone watch Barbenheimer? Oh, I actually haven't had any time. I've been like busy working and then playing. So sad for me. That's pretty much been the same for me. Uh, I it's on my to do list. I'm like, you know what? One of these days, maybe just like a, a Monday morning or something, I'll go watch a yeah, movie. Tuesdays Tuesdays are my movie day right now as I'm, you know, looking for looking for stuff to do. So Tuesdays get a cheap IMAX seat at the humongous Lincoln Center IMAX movie theater. It's great. So then did you go see Barbenheimer? I have not seen Barbie, but I have seen Oppenheimer and it, it was I stared at faces for th- 3 hours and I didn't hate it. So <laughs> I enjoyed it. Coming up on uh this week, you know, we've got we by the time this is come out, we'll have finished the first Schoonhammer Open on the West Coast, and we'll be prepping for Nova, one of the big U.S. tournaments. And I think I'll be going, I think. Anyone else on this podcast going? Uh, I will be there. Apparently, I might have won Nova last time. I don't talk about it a lot, so... It's time to get the repeat belt, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going there again as a holiday because i had a good time at nova um but it would be nice slash hilarious if i win again but i uh, i don't go into tournaments thinking i'm going to win i'm just going there partly as a holiday because i'm actually landing quite early um just because it turned out to be more convenient i'm not able to make it but um i'm curious about uh any other adventures that you're planning while you're in the area uh so last time i didn't get a half smoke partly because the, what, the place I wanted to get it from, I was advised by the locals not to go unless I wanted to die in the nicest way possible. Because uh, they were like, the week before, someone literally got shot and then stabbed two different people. So I was like, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, so I'll, I need to get a half smoke this time. Uh, I'm now, because it's closer in the city, well, it's in the center of the city. So I can do more touristy stuff. Uh, but I have a habit every time I go to America, except when we went to the US Open final. Um, I keep walking. Like I, when I go on like my day out walk, I will accidentally walk 20 kilometers. So I did it last time at <laughs> Nova and I did it again at LVO. But in LVO, my own problem was I didn't realize you're not supposed to walk around everywhere in uh, Las Vegas. So I, I learned think America, that. America in general is not kind to walkers. I could walk everywhere in DC, right? And then I, I was walking in. <laughs> Las Vegas, and I was like, oh, the only people I can see are homeless, questionable people, and I think people the police want. And uh, basically, they were like, yeah, yeah, the, 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 you were probably the most standout one because you look completely normal, which makes you stand out. So, on, I don't like, actually know where LVO is taking place, but... It's, oh, no, it's Las a Vegas. little bit off the strip, too. So, like, yeah. it was, yeah. most of the other places in, in Las Vegas are more walkable than, than that spot. 
Yeah, the closer you are to the strip, the more walkable it is, in my experience. But to be fair, Google Maps said I could cross over the intersection. I didn't realize your intersections have no pavements, and I specifically put into Google walking only. So Google wanted me to walk through the motorway. Uh, So I had to walk around the motorway. And then I decided to walk back because I was like, I knew the way. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. I uh, should have taxied both ways, and I learned that. But that will probably happen again in terms of walking. That's I, for what it's worth. The gigantic intersection thing—that is a Las Vegas specific phenomenon. I don't think most places have eight-way highway, eight-way intersections. Well, I was like, uh, why did Google Maps say it was possible to walk? I mean, technically it is right, but in the UK, it doesn't tell you to walk over bridges that have no pavements. So, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe yeah. that's how Americans die. So. I think um, looking forward in the UK, there's a Warhammer World tournament coming up. Right? It's the week before Nova. <laughs> so you're going to be getting a lot of practice Kunama. before Nova then. Yeah, that happened incidentally. So like the craziest w- thing could be I could win Warhammer World, then fly to Nova and then win Nova. But that's that's not going to happen. That is no way going to happen. But it could, but it's not. I'm not saying it will, it won't, but there's a potential. Yeah, it's always good to go into a tournament with uh, fewer expectations, I think, and just play the best you can so you don't have as much mental pressure on yourself as you play your games. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've developed a new... Well, it's an old mentality, uh, because I find, like, going, focusing only on winning will just lead you down a toxic rabbit hole. So I'm going to try and win Best Painted again, uh, which I probably won't get, but I'm still going to try, so... Yeah, we've got a we've got a term that we uh, brought up in an earlier episode that we call sweatiquette, and it is the the balance of uh, having good etiquette in a sweaty environment. Um, I'm especially yes. curious to hear about your take on that as being a successful competitive player that is generally well respected. Uh, I like to personally reference myself as a sweat lord with a heart of gold. So <laughs> recently I've been having problems where I've been spending too much time explaining all my kill team rules to my opponents. And then my my friends in London are just like, just don't explain anything, John. Only explain if asked. And I'm like, no, I must explain. So I've been trying to strike a balance there. Yeah, I think um, a, good, a good shorthand we talked about in the past is like, you ask them for, I'll tell you all my gotchas rather than every yeah. single rule. Because those are probably the ones that come up the most. Like if you're What's a Wimbledon player... Oh my gosh. Well, no, it's like with the issue with newer kill teams, they have everyone is so individualized. They have so many moving parts, it's become more problematic. But it's like every Wormbow player always ask, always ask to read their rule and always ask them to explain it because they will either intentionally or unintentionally get it wrong. And it's not their fault if they get it unintentionally wrong. So. Yeah. I actually just caught someone this last weekend in LA on a small mistake for Eliminate Guards. They mentioned that Eliminate Guards is super powerful, and I, every time I've heard that, I need to remind people that Eliminate Guards has pretty large amount of counterplay because it is specifically calling out the center line and behind as where you can score it on. So if your opponent rushes up, if they're playing a melee-centric team and they end up on your objectives, you can't score Eliminate Guards. And on yep. some maps, there's literally two objectives that you can score eliminate guards on. Or yep. like, it's generally at least three. And then, yeah. So on some of them, like there's a diagonal board on open where there's five. And that's that's really easy to score it on. But in general, it's about three objectives. And if your opponent runs at you, you can't score eliminate guards. Yeah. No, that, that catch. I only learned about that rule two or three months ago. And I was like, I've let so many people score this against me for free when... There was think, way more counterplay than I thought. So. Yeah, there, there's a good amount of counterplay, which is, I think, a very interesting point that a lot of people miss on stuff, which happens a lot. I think, you know, what, an important thing about being a sweat lord is that you understand that people make mistakes and that you can have a way to make a mistake and move on rather than yeah. uh, making a mistake and digging in and saying that I've never, I haven't done anything wrong. Which So, is, like, my, my thing is I will allow all take backs on the dice have been rolled. Or like, it's like something hasn't been revealed that can't be taken back, like a tack op. Like you do something, I'll I'll reveal this. Like it's very rare, but it's like, as long as dice haven't been rolled, generally I'll I'll allow everything back, which still surprises people to this day. They're like, I'm going to move this and take this shot. And I was like, are you actually out? Um, Or before they move, I was like, let's measure out. 
oh, you can't actually do that shot because I saw you couldn't. So do you want to do something else? <laughs> and I know people who will play the opposite and like, oh, you can't take that shot. Uh, the issue is you've now moved off your starting point, so you actually can't move back. So you're going to have to move somewhere else with that operative. So it's... <laughs> I like to call it by... Obviously, I have more incentive to be nicer because I have a channel. But people forget I also have the power to shadow ban, which I use meticulously well. Uh, but <laughs> I generally want to play a game where people I've beaten someone not because they've made a mistake but because I've outplayed them and I don't count outplaying them as capitalizing on you making a misplay that you could have fixed if someone rushes forward and then immediately rolls dice I've had to warn people and go like I would have let you take that back but you've rolled dice so we have to resolve this now yeah I've yeah once dice are on the table it's it's another thing I have I have given people rewinds and like oh we got a rule wrong do you want to redo your move or do you want to lock your dice in with the mistake? And I, I think that's okay. Um, so I've let people like fully rewind or it's like, all right, you want these dice. Well, you could get these dice on the wrong, on like the target you don't want, or you can redirect it, but that's like, or you have to reroll the whole thing, which uh, yeah. has happened. I think too. one time I had someone rush forward thinking um, they were safe, like in cover while they could grenade me. And they were like, ran forward and rolled it and I measured and I was like, I'm obscured. For me, for you to get a shot, you're going to have to move into the open. So you can keep that roll, but you will just be in the open. But their goal was to like uh, not trade. So when they they took it, because they like, I was like, oh, if you take it back, then you won't actually be able to get that shot. So we'd have to re-roll everything. And I took the shot and then I like, ensure because that's why I set up. So then couldn't get the trade. He got upset, but I was like, Look, if, if you just didn't rush forward, we wouldn't be in this situation. That's why if you yeah. play me, I, I pre-measure, like, I am um, no, like, I think the funniest thing, when I was at Nova, <laughs> I think it was against, uh, Nick was watching one of my games, uh, East Coast Nick. Well, there's yeah, probably yeah. a lot of Nicks. Nick Craven, Nick Craven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he just saw all my measuring tools and was just shocked. And I was just like, oh, no, that's just, you know, I might have to measure an inch, five individual inches, four inches. I need all those measuring tools. And if you want to talk about measuring tools, we've got one from our product sponsor, right, Jason? That is absolutely true. You can get your hands on it too. It is just another kill team gauge. And we're going to have a, a code at the end of the episode, a secret keyword that gets you a discount on this gauge just as well. Yeah. I heard it's spelled in French. Oh, there's actually, we have a couple of extremely promotional ones. So we have a misprint on the original Etsy shop logo. So if people are interested and they want one of those, message us personally on the Discord and maybe we if can. If you're get, French, get no one will know. Ones. Yeah. Just another kill team gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to bump it, talk to you about, because you've traveled, you actually have access to a handful of the regions. Have you? How many regions have you played in, and do you have any notable differences between them that you remember? So I've played basically all over England. I haven't played in Wales or Scotland, but they have very small scenes anyway. Um, I've played against the Spanish. I've, pr I've, <laughs> I've pretty much played against a lot of Spanish people. And obviously I've played against Americans. So I kind of do have a good thing, because like this is one of my things. I will... Because uh, my X-Wing friends were like, they traveled all over the country to play because they were like, look, we're in the UK. It's actually quite easy to travel around, like even though it's two hours. Like we have people in America who's just like six hours or four hours for their local. So just doing that. And then like I'm one of the few UK players who actually want to travel. <laughs> so, well, not want to travel, but will actually commit to traveling, shall we say. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I've got a good head on the global scene to an extent like the key areas i've even played a lot of french people as well um have you been playing most of the players at warhammer world i think for the spanish french players because or have you gone to those regions specifically uh so most of the spanish people i've played are warhammer gw uk events games workshop and then we've had french players come to our london events so i've played that's how i've played the spanish and french but and i would I'll say Oh, it's like, um, <clears throat> well, because that's the thing. It's like, I think one of the biggest pitfalls when you come into practicing is, or playing, people will get so, f like, you'll get a lot of games in, but it comes to the point where you can, you're not beating 
the team, you're beating the player or you're learning the player or you're losing to the player. So it, it just means you get locked in this like uh, tunnel visioned play style and you don't realize what you're actually doing wrong. It, it like, cause I had a friend who was just play his mate and they got really good, but then they got to a ceiling point where they just constantly, one would beat the other. And it wasn't skill. It was just, they knew how the other played. And even if you play in a good scene of like five to 10 people, if you're only playing those same people, eventually you'll get locked in. Um, so you do need to travel to like, cause you get, you see stuff you wouldn't see, even if it's unoptimal, it's another way of thinking that you can add to your memory to prepare, but it does get quite complicated because people get very sensitive about uh how powerful their area is but i would say <clears throat> spain is the best right like there's there's no there's no go there's no way going around that they get so many reps in they have so many big large tournaments it's just hard to compete and the issue is generally everyone around the world they're best players are basically all at the same level. The only thing that differentiates differentiates it is how much practice or not practice, but how many varied opponents and how many tournaments they can play. And you just can't compete with Spain because they can have like a 36 man tournament minimum every month, which is just I think it's like every week almost. When it's like at their peak, it's like every two weeks, every week. So yeah. it's really hard to compete. Um but generally, yeah, everyone's best player player or players are around the same. But I would say America are crazy on aggro, like crazy <laughs> aggressive. Like when I was playing in Nova, I was like, all the Pathfinder players were like, because I was like, I'm talking to you about it, and then it was like, oh, you know, you can do like Montcar, turning point one, bonded and that. So all they did is like turning point one, bonded, recon sweep, Montcar. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm I'm doing nothing. And I just like stalled. And then they were like, oh, I'm out of gas turning point two. I was like, yeah. So I'm going to do recon sweep, bonded, and want car and just wipe them. Um, uh, whereas UK players can be more defensive. Um, they're more cautious. <clears throat> and then French players can be explosively aggressive. Like they'll move up to, they'll just like bully you into a point and then play. Um, the Sp Spanish are just very strong. They'll just, you can't really like underestimate them. And then I think that's all the scenes I covered. You haven't played right? Poland, I guess. Oh, I, Poland, I it sounds, played Poland. Poland sounds like a very Vetgard, Vetgard centric scene. If uh, I love killing Vetgard. Previous podcasts are so, to be believed. Oh, my Pathfinders have demolished Vetgard. Like, yeah. I mean, I think Jason, you know, Jason is also an incredibly aggressive player at the moment. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, my <clears throat> the last team that I was playing main was Phobos, and I just brought all in cursors, all engage, and then just went 6-0 and in the local league, just shooting, 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 <laughs> catching people in crazy angles. Like, ignoring obscuring for the entire team is literally insane. But not that Ryan's, because, like, that's why Orion is always such a good challenge, because he... He's like one of the few Americans I've played who doesn't play hyper aggro. He just plays very cautiously and un-American like. So that that's probably what makes him such a good player. But go on. Yeah. Uh the other team that I've been doing lately is um Legionary All Corn. It's a uh, way more fun than I was expecting. The three inches of movement stealing all over the place with like fight on death, you just like chain lightning through people and it's ridiculous. Um it's, Everyone, it's, everyone sleeps on corn. Yeah, all corn is super fun. It's like Savage Butcher is back on the menu. You just have like the Chosen go in there with your plus one damage crits and just like fight twice and kill two people. And if they fight and kill you, then you fight on death and kill the third one and get your Savage Butcher. It's beautiful. An extremely aggressive play style, as you can see. Yes. Well, America's... that's what terrified me as uh, when I played Path, uh, when I was playing my Harlequins at Nova. Um, someone was like, I'm going to go all corn. And I was like, well, what can corn do? It was like auto retain as a crit. And it was like the butcher was doing eight damage. The, ch the chosen was doing eight damage. So I was like, well, I'm just going to shoot you and uh, not charge. And that's how I had to win that game, which was bizarre. Yeah, I think all corn is, it can have some cool stuff going, but getting into the first set of melee can be a little bit rough. And then, you know, there are some teams that just kind of cripple the strategy, <laughs> like like Vetguard, just sit on your guys and you can't move off, which is really annoying. 
Yeah, anyone else that's too aggressive, if they just put one model a little bit too far forward and then all of a sudden you've got like the teeth sink in and you just rip and tear until you're all the way through. Yeah, I think John's actual uh, big team coming up in our current peanut butter beatdown <laughs> and jelly is Hand of the Archon, a team that he was playing very aggressively, I think, when they first came out, right? Yeah, it's like explosive aggression because um, you French have to play hyper well, you have to play hyper aggressive against elites. So it's like people are going to do what are you going to do? Move up, shoot, and then dash back down. I was like, wow, yes. And um, oh, I love Hand of the Archon. Yeah. So That's this something. section is our peanut beatdown and jealous, where we try to talk about what makes a team the beatdown and fun. And the other part is what makes people jealous when they think about your team. So as a Hand of the Archon specialist, you know, what keeps you beating down with the Hand of the Archon and what makes people jealous? Well, it's like, it was weird because at Warhammer first, I was the only Hand of the Archon player because everyone had like abandoned them. I was speaking to the Spanish players and they're like, it's, a, it's an entirely tempo based team. The moment you can't get tempo, there's no point playing. And I was like, oh, but why don't you just play cautiously until then? So no one thought like, I mean, Warhammer first had issues, but um. No one thought I would do that well with um, Thingy, uh, Hand of the Archon. But I did manage to come fourth out of 117 with them. But it's like, um, I think the way you have to play them is you have to be quite cautious turning point one, and then you just go like balls to the wall turning point two. Because like, you're in the hand of dice, but you can kind of set it up in such a way where... Um, like people, I found people just going, I'll pass to get plus one command point. And people go, I'll pass as well. And I'll go, great. I now have five command points for the command point reroll. And then that's how I ensure my uh, dice would go off. So I would play matchups to force people to pass in the strategic phase because they were like, well, I'm not playing a strategic phase where you get plus one CP. So I'm not going to do anything. And I was like, great. You don't have any of your defensive buffs up or like offensive buffs. But it's just gambling in that kind of way and like people just hate when you kill get a pain token and then can use that to either like dash back down i think my favorite thing is using the shredder because i did send an faq about it because i thought they were going to change how you gain pain tokens like with the medic if you hit them in a blast so i thought they would change it so if you killed someone in a blast you'd get all your pain tokens at the end currently you still get them every time you kill someone because they haven't they've refused to clarify it so, um, what I would do, blast someone, they'd be my From Darkness Death. No, no, no. So, I would From Darkness Death someone I can't hit. Then hit the guy in cover and go, cool, you're in cover, you retain a hit. If I roll wild, you're dead. Then I would allocate my From Darkness Death on them. So I go like, I've got five dice hitting on freeze with rending. I can turn one dice into a crit and then another into a crit. So on five dice, you should get... Uh, one crit 51.8 percent of the time which would not go roll into two crits explode them get a pain token and then if you've still got people to hit and now you know you're going to kill people you go i'll scatter into him i'll use my pain token dead i've got another pain token i'll scatter into him pain token dead i've got another pain token i'm going to dash back down so i did it to a crew guy hit five crew killed four and dash back down so it's like when you can do explosive stuff like that and you can kind of break um, the synergy of the game by charging, killing someone. And if you already got plus one AP, you can then shoot and then after killing them, burn to dash away. And it just screws people up. Even though I repeatedly told them, if I burn this to dash, I can do it. And especially when I kill them on their turn and then I dash through a door. That really catches people out. But it's a very tempo-based team. But when you can do that sort of tempo-ness, it just swings the game in your favor. So even when it's their turn, they can't do much. Uh, so you were using the pain token in the fight from a guard and then dashing away? Yeah, that's like, like even uh, when people would charge me, they'd go, because I would actually start giving more people plus one attack and lethal five up. So they would fight me and I was like, I've popped rendered in combat. Oh, look, I've rolled three crits. You rolled a hit. So you hit me free damage. I kill you. I'm now going to dash through this, like, dash away. And they just go, ah, oh, you can do that in my turn. I was like, anytime I get a pain token and you've just given me a pain token. So, 
Is that? I didn't even realize that's the the wording on it. I am surprised about the medic thing, and you did that at Warhammer World, so it's past past smell check then. Well, yeah, it was like so. I've I I emailed that like um, a month after the book came out because I was like, oh, obviously they're gonna target this with the medic thing, but they've repeatedly refused not to, so I have to assume it's intentional. So that's how I've been playing it because the medic thing is technically different but kind of similar. So if I hadn't sent off an FAQ, I'd play like the medic. But because I've sent off two FAQs and they haven't answered it, I was like, okay, then it's intentional. But that's the it can that kind of tempo swing, and it's really hard to deal with Hand of the Archon once they get the tempo swing. And it's I think what catched people out is you have to practice for Into the Dark, but the team's quite flexible in terms of um, you have to pick... like. But the thing I found bizarre online, everyone's like, never take the Dark Lance. The Dark Lance has been amazing for me. He's either killed a Marine and completely secured me a flank or done nothing but stopped people coming down that flank. So like, either way he works. And the weirdest, is something I find online in general. People don't want to take operatives who do nothing just to stop your opponent doing something. They want, if they're in their mind, if an operative doesn't kill, it's not worth taking. That makes sense. Yeah, I think there's a threat projection, which I'm sure is something that Jason knows very well. Yeah, that's a, it's a, yeah, that's gold. Like that's some of the most solid advice I've ever heard. I mean that, that's great. I'm huge on Team Dark Lance as well. Um, I played Hand of the Archon at Adepticon, and I won all my games with them there. And the Dark Lance was like super duper MVP. Um, I didn't play in like the in the big thing. I just did like the day one pods and then the team event. Um, which was it was a lot of fun, but yeah, Hand of the Archon, that was my team for that. They're super fun. Dark Lance, I'm a huge fan of 100 yeah, percent for the same reasons. And for anyone that's listening, you know the Power from Pain ability does say that for the free dash, the condition is when incapacitating an enemy operative with this operative. So if you do it on your opponent's turn with a guard fight, you definitely can take a dash, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, so you can go guard hatchway fight. Someone goes, cool, I'll fight you. Uh, but you're like in the way and then you just dash outside. Yeah, dash out of safety. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's even useful on open when you can dash through solid Octarius walls. Because all of a sudden people go, okay, I let that happen. And I was like, yes, yes, you did. So I'm yeah. sure I'm not the only one wondering about some of the problems with Hand of the Archon. You need to get pain tokens to get three APL. So that makes those early turns difficult to to plan for the doors what's your approach there so i even told elliot this at one of the at warhammer fest and he was like wow that's sad but uh i spent i think about two hours so i i had this <laughs> thing where i didn't like into the dark and then i was like if i have to learn into the dark i'm gonna just have to plan everything out so i spent about two hours uh just planning all my movements turning point one on all the maps because it's very easy. And <clears throat> what I learned, normally in Into the Dark with other teams, you can like switch what you want to do so you can react. But with Hand of the Archon, you just have to ignore everything your opponent is doing and stick to your plan of who is going to open a door. So generally, you actually only need to open two doors at most, usually three, turning point one. So you need to dedicate two to three operatives who are going to open doors. The main problem it comes is on to capture... Uh, no, secure. No, it is capture. Yeah, no, secure. Sorry, secure and loot when you need an APL. Because uh, when I was playing in the narrative tournament, you can spend uh, like narrative points to start with a pain token on someone. And that changed my life. But um, yeah, so I would have three people to two people dedicate to opening doors and then three operatives dedicated for skewing points. So the issue is people would then go, oh, but I want this operative to do this and I want to react to that. And I was like, you just have to play your game. Like, because the thing is we played an into the, no, a mixed event at Dark Sphere in London. And I think I was the only Hand of the Archon player who went three and one. Everyone else went four losses, I think, because they just couldn't play into the dark. And when they played into the dark, it just all went wrong. But you just have to plan everything. Like I usually... um the melee operatives either secured points to open doors and like the warrior as well, or my leader. So it's like, 
anyone who wasn't going to get a shot or get into combat would just open a door or capture an objective. And then you just leave the, what do you call it? The gunner on engage and you leave the, oh, what's it called? Disciple of Yelendra last just to threaten people because people, like the weirdest thing, I'd play hand of the Archon players and they would just immediately activate the Disciple of Yelendra. I'd activate her last and my opponents would just get terrified and then I was like, she's going to go into the point and capture it. And now it's the end of the turning point. And they're just like, what? I was just like, but you could have like dashed and then moved and dashed and run through this door and like hit my team. And I was like, yeah. And then she would have died. So uh, you just have to dictate everything. But it's like really boring to do, but it's necessary. And the problem is you see your opponent doing stuff and you just go, cool, you're setting up. I can't do anything to negate that. So I'm just going to keep opening doors and booping points. Oh. There's kind of like a theme there with the the same way that you're looking at the Disciple of Yolindra is kind of like the same way that you're looking at the Dark Lance. And both of them, just their presence, changing how your opponent makes decisions is a huge factor. And that's just the key is in the silence. It's, uh, I like yeah. that. It was yeah, like, I, I even played a Hand of the Archon guy recently and I was like, oh, you can get that. Uh, I'm going to leave one guy you can get on a two up. But if you get that, I'm going to get to counter your Disciple of Lindra. And he went for it, and I was like, okay. And then he failed to hit the guy in the four up. So the other guy just punched him. And I was like, cool, turning point one, I've stopped your Disciple of Yolindra. I don't need to worry about you kill him anymore. The Disciple of Yolindra, for listeners who have no idea what operative we're talking about, is the <laughs> special character with the torment grenade that can cause permanent injury, which actually gets through, ignores injury because it's regardless of all of the rules. And I believe the exact wording is you pick a point and everyone within two inches of that point on a D6 of three or higher, basically, you give them two poison damage every turn and permanent injury that you can never remove. Ah, so they actually nerf this. So it's at the start of the turning point now instead of the end. So Mm. the hilarious thing, uh, Hyrotech Circle hate it because now it's after they heal. But against everyone else, it's enough. It's a minor, yeah, you, you can't stop people from controlling with the damage now compared to before yeah. when you people would actually die immediately. So yeah. very powerful and open because you can actually throw it through walls on like on in the dark where you you yeah. can all you can do on in the dark is curve it around a corner at a 90 degree angle. Oh, the, the curve throws people off because they're like, oh, that's not six inches. I was like, actually, you'd f- you can find I can throw at right angles. So yes, you yes, can you could throw it at like a U-turn angle if you if necessary. Yes. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, it is within six inches of the operative, not visible. So you know, just like the Toxhorn on Felgor, she can actually throw a mean curveball. Well, it's funny, like because you get all these commando players forward deploying now, and like the moment you tell them what the torment grenade what su- does, they suddenly stop coming forwards and they just like space out as much as possible. I actually have a player locally who's been struggling a lot against commandos and I think space marines and or chaos cults even. What would you tell them that you do differently on Hand of the Archon against teams like commandos? Because they say that commandos have, they're aggressive enough where they can push tempo on turn one, they can punch you when you're weakest on open, and that you trade poorly against 10 wounds and a 4-5 melee profile. Uh, so I take the leader with power weapon and I take the blaster and dark lance. So if they get too close, they die. And the issue is, you, you want the blaster over the shredder because the blaster is going to kill a boy. And once again, you take the dark lance to just go. If you come out to trade someone, they're going to like. I'll wait for your rocket boy to come out because your rocket boy is going to die. And then once your rocket boy is dead, I have no other worries. So you force them into this waiting scenario, and it's like you just torment grenade them because they hate being injured because they. Once they start charging into you when they have eight wounds and they're hitting on fours, all of a sudden like you can out melee them. And it's just like if if they're gonna forward deploy, like even just take the infiltration, even if that means you're not gonna take first. It's like I always deploy the gunner on engage. And if I'm playing against commandos, I'll deploy like the the flame the flenzer, I think. I think on the engage. Flare, flare, yep. Yeah. Because the thing is minus one damage, you give it a six up DPR. It just charges and then ties up a commando. You get a free pain token. So they've brought someone near to you who's now giving you plus one APL for turning point two. 
even on turning point one, if you position yeah. your models correctly, if your opponent is putting a Breacher close enough to Dynamite, you could theoretically get a charge with the Flare and carve a little bit of pain off onto an operative within six of it, right? Yeah, and if they do get the con within range, you can just torment the Dynamite for a wall and laugh. And then, like, the six of Feel No Pain messes up the breakpoints and, like, yeah. Not everyone is thinking about that as in depth as they should. So, like an orc doing four or five, it can actually just like bounce off of a one of the hand of the archon operatives, surprisingly. And your equipment, you can actually buy the extra attack on the default profile, right? Yeah. So against commandos, I generally go. What did I take? Uh, I don't take the. Pl- I th- yeah, I don't think I take the plasma grenade, but I just invest in depending on the mission, the banner. Um, I don't take the stun anymore, but I take plus one attack and lethal five up. And I just put that in like Disciple of Yelendra, uh, normal guy, and like anyone I expect to see combat. Just creating more pivot operatives so that you can do yeah. a little bit of everything against them. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, that's some sound advice. Commandos as well. It's just like go all melee and just outdo them. It's it's kind of surprising, but that's that's how it's worked out for me with Hand of the Arc. Well, it's like, yeah, your melee operatives will kill them. So, And the thing is, the moment they pop just a scratch, you make it cost plus one CP and they never use it again. So, And that then also, true. if you just like position for one explosively violent turn, just lurk and, and then like try to tease out the just a scratch right away and then just murder everyone. Yeah. So really aiming for that turn two, but with an eye towards countering the turn one aggressive play that commandos off do. Yeah, you just put, like, even if you want to put the the Crimson Duelist on Engage, but generally I'd put one of your melee on Engage and just go, like, okay, you come close, I'm going to charge you. Because what they can do is they can do, like, um, what's his name? Uh, the knob charges in, kills someone, and pops a smoke on himself if he knows it all conceal, because then you have to charge him. But what he doesn't expect is you just charge in and pass. Because especially if you charge in with the Flenser, all of a sudden they tie up. And then you just like throw a tox spot, um, toxin, and on a two up, he's super injured. Yeah, that's right. Because, Ooh. because the torment grenade, yeah, is not good. <laughs> and <you laughs> on, it does hit your own operatives. It can hit your own operatives. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was double checking right here because I was like, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but I wouldn't want to do it on my own operative. I could avoid it. I did. I did it once when someone charged three of their operatives into mine. So I was like, well. I've survived all these combats, but everyone's going to poison today. And that was your flare agent getting triple charged? No, I think it was just a normal warrior. It's just because he had four attacks and they were just fluffing. So, Yeah, the the downside of the old melee teams compared to the newer five attack melee teams. Was there any anything else that you wanted to cover on the Hand of the Archon? It sounds like there's plenty of things for people to be jealous about, but maybe the oh. one downside is nine operatives. Well, it is nine operatives, but I always um, play the usually uh, the delay one. The delay Penis one is arrogance. really good. Yeah, minus arrogance is one CP to pass an activation window, so you play as ten operatives versus yeah. nine. Really screws up elites and people with like even corsairs and harlequins. But it, there's a whole mind game situation about um, like capricious mind. You know, when you pass in the so you if you pass in the first strategic phase, you get an extra command point. Right, but then if your opponent passes, that's the end of the strategic phase. So what I will so turning point one, I never take the gamble unless it's someone I know who has to, like uh what do you call it? Um what's their names? Uh Harlequins. Uh well Void Dance Troop. I think that card are a big one. No, no smart Vegar players will just pass. Um because they've realized how powerful it is you getting fleet of foot. Um but other kill teams who can't are I think this mechanic is, yeah. Have to, yeah, have to turn have something to. on. They have to. So you can just, like, um, and, and stupid breacher players who are just obsessed with putting attack order down everywhere every turn. But uh, generally, I would actually not pass turning point one, then pass turning point two, with the idea of tricking my opponent to pass as well. Because as I said, I actually prefer when my opponent passes, because then we're just playing on our raw stats, and I will have, like, five command points for a reroll. And I think the other thing that catches people out is uh, it, it oddly worked so much on Warhammer World. Uh, not Warhammer World, Warhammer Fest, 
because you've got a strategic ploy called Denizens of the Dark, where as long as you remain within blue of your drop zone, you have super conceal. So I'd put everyone in the open on barricades and they would go like, cool, uh, I'm going to recon dash onto that vantage. I was like, oh, I've picked infiltration. And they were like, cool, uh, I'll let you go first. Like, great. It's like, okay, cool. Uh, so they're like, I'm going to do like uh, all my reroll dice. And I was like, cool, I'm going to play Denizens of the Dark. And like, oh, what does that do? It gives me super conceal as long as I'm within blue of my drop zone. They're like, oh, oh. And the thing is, people forget you have to be within blue of your drop zone. You don't have to be wholly within. So I have had models just within blue on points in the open behind the barricade just going, wow, I'm too shadow for you. They do have to get within red to negate it, but they're not doing that turning point one. Yeah. And, and like, you know, that means that your concealed models in the open, kind of in the open against all the vantage yeah. points are just, yeah, taunting. Yeah. It completely messes up people because you, especially when you've got bad boards, like that have little to no heavy in the drop zone, you can suddenly make your drop zone or n near your drop zone completely safe. So you can play a very safe and turly turning point one and then turning point two just go, cool. Uh, and I think that's thrown a lot of people off because... Having access to super conceal, even if it's limited, is really powerful. And then obviously fleet of foot, although it's weaker than the Corsair version, but just being able to move and dash is really powerful. Or like dash and move. I think it's a dash in conjunction with a fallback or a normal move. So yes. close enough. Yeah, as long as it's tied to another move. Yeah, I wish it was just like the Corsair version. So yeah, that'd be cool. just, just baked in. But you get to yeah. you get to suck up, you know, people's souls. That's that's gotta be worth something, right, John? Well, yeah, they, they have this weird thing. So the best thing about them is they can take Recon. They can also take Seek and Destroy, but you take Recon with Pay the Soul Debt. So you take the Pay the Soul Debt to cover your killing. You never take it against someone who has nine or eight operatives. Or you can get away if they have nine, but I don't. Um, but always take it against elites, right? But then you just take Recover Item, which you're going to max, and then any other Recon tack up, like Courier, Surge forwards, you you will get that. And um, I th I've seen a lot of people say pay the soldier isn't good, but the thing is, the way you look at it is, so you need seven pain tokens to get one, well, one VP and nine to get two. But if you look at it, so you get two for killing somewhere, ten or more wounds. So ha you actually love Hyrotech Circle because they're worth something stupid like eighteen pain tokens, something like that, because they've got so many characters uh, with more than ten wounds. Yeah, they've got three. The Cryptech, the Despotech, and the thingy. And if they come back, you kill them again to get more, more pain tokens. So I've had Hyrotech players refuse to res their guys because they're like, I just don't want to give you pain tokens. But as long as you get either four kills, as four elite kills, well, that's eight, uh, or you kill eight guys, you just need your flayer to strike someone with a crit and you've maxed your tackle. So you don't actually have to kill nine to five operatives you just have to kill eight to four and when you play it that way that's fine because like the key thing is as long as your player has charged someone and hit with the, hit with a crit you are going to max pay the soldier because like if they alpha your flayer that is horrible but no one does so never never let that happen otherwise you will not max pay the soldier I feel like the flare almost incentivizes anti-alpha striking anyways, just because his yeah. defensive rules are so strong. So it's like the oh, first gosh. time you fight against the flare or shoot against the flare, you're like, I didn't really do anything, did I? And you're like, and then you just get turned off of actually interacting with the operative. But the way you're talking about it, it is very powerful if it can get even one or two, because it can get two pain tokens. It's not that crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I, the funny thing is like a vet guard player ran up and shot it. And I was like, OK, I'm going to hit you with... Uh, my my overcharged last gone. It's like, well, I'm just over, I'm going to hit you, and it's like I got a crit and three hits. So it's like I saved the crit and I blocked one hit. So it's like, oh, you take four damage. So actually, I take two because it's minus one damage to a minimum of one, and then I get my six up, feel no pains. Oh, I've saved them both, and you just stopped attacking the the flare after that. So because everyone forgets it's to a minimum of one for for the flare. He is the only operative left that has the minimum of one. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So dumb. And then when you have the six up DPR, it's just like you laugh. Like she, they've tanked so much damage for me. It's 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 crazy, crazy. I think it even survived like a melter gun that didn't roll crits once. Czar. Yeah, 
I mean, he's a crazy powerful operative. Just being able to reduce damage across the board and be a very powerful melee obje melee operative while also getting you part of a tack up. I've always found that the recon into um, basically the recon with an aggressive tack up is really, really powerful because you can play like the positional game up front and force your opponent to come in. And then when they do, you run them up against the, the anvil. <laughs> Oh yeah, and then it's like going into the dark, even though it's hard for them, you just go pay the soul debt usually, but then you go recover item and explore unex unexplored rooms, and you just like max everything, because recon's dumb on into the dark. But it's like, the, the other thing is like, all your operatives can be a threat, like realistically, because you've got, um, what was it called, from Darkness Death, where you can nominate someone to turn a crit into a hit, if you're not in their line of sight. So... I like the Sky Splinter Assassin because he's got ceaseless lethal five up and in every five up he does two mortal wounds. So he actually regularly for me rolls three to four crits, which is eight mortal wounds. And because he can flip people from conceal, he will actually kill people hiding behind barricades and stuff. Um, and he can even like shred elites because all of a sudden they take eight mortal wounds and then they have to save three crit saves. Well, they have to make four free saves against four crits. And they actually just either survive injured or die so yeah and you can even give it the poison so it's doing three three two two if you wanted it i never would never take the poison i've heard people like hand of the archon players swear to me they've taken the poison and i was like it's just a waste it only buffs your normal damage there's no point it's just you get more value from giving yourself plus one attack and lethal five up in close combat this sounds like a good time to move into the next section, which is niche tactics. And we chatted a little bit about commandos already, but um, there's a couple things that we, you know, there's a, there's plenty to talk about with commandos. So on that note, it looks like commandos are sitting in a great position. Let's dive in. Niche tactics at S tier. <laughs> I think they are oh, like no. the new entrance to the S tier as of the batch, the patch from Q2, right, where they got the new operative. They are what I would call a technical S tier. They they do have everything going for them, but the issue is because Colts have been nerfed. I mean, Colts are still maybe the best team in the game. But they're like more manageable now. Um, it actually because Inquisition have been nerfed enough. I mean, like absolute authority should be once per game. Like it's still dumb. So Phobos are kind of like actually we still can't play into Inquisition. But all the other elite teams can, and commandos really hate elites. So especially we, if we see a rise in legionary. Um, but that's, that's the thing. Now elites have less counters. If elites come back, that would actually negatively hurt commandos. Yeah. But I, I don't know if, even know if there's like at Goodham, if there's any legionary players. We have four intercessors, I think. So there's a fair, any, there's a fair number of space marines. I think there are any might be legionary? one or two. There might be one or two. Because, like, the thing that would terrify me as a commando player is the Anointed and the Chosen and the Shrive Talon. Like, yeah, you just even, can't beat them in melee. Nope, not even the Sorcerer that gives himself lethal 5 up. Because you fight him and he just shreds you with more wounds. And he sucks away your soul. Yeah, he does. Like, literally. The amount of times I've punched Warp Fire Sorcerers, like, Warp Coven, not Warp Coven, um, the Legionary, legionary Sorcerers, yeah. who haven't gone, who haven't empowered themselves, of like, oh, wow, this is great. You've rolled no crits. Yeah, yeah now you're dead. So, um, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, commandos. Uh, you were you were actually one of the you pushed commandos pretty hard when they when the game first came out. I remember reading oh, yeah, articles I about got them nerfed. Yeah. yeah, talking about double dynamite plays with four deploy and like locking people into deployments. <laughs> so yeah, that that, was... that has gone away. We can't do two two dynamites, but we can. You know, getting the extra CP has allowed the tri prong deployment pressure on turning point two. Yes. Are you a big fan of that? Yes. So it's like, even uh, like the play as commandos is you will spend two command points and shush, or you spend three command points and hold out for just a scratch. Because the issue is, um, so when I used to play commandos, um, GW didn't realize that the way they worded Dakadash, it allowed to work with any weapon, including the dynamite. So I'd give him plus one APL, or I wouldn't, and basically he'd deploy and conceal flip to engage, dash, daka dash for two AP and throw a dynamite in someone's face. Um, or you give him plus one APL so you can move, then daka dash and dynamite. 
Um, Luckily, that's gone because that was luckily. insane. Luckily. Yes, because uh, I mean you can still pin people down, but the thing is, they're better melee operatives in the game. But the current meta slash previous meta had melee operatives they could deal with, like um, <clears throat> even though goats like Felgor Ravager were a good melee team. Actually, they didn't really one-shot commandos or could take out multiple commandos. And Chaos Cops, until they get Torment, is actually quite manageable in combat. But, yeah, it's like I would be terrified playing against Legionary, even Intercession with Assault Marines, which are shred commandos. So it's like... um, It's... I would still... Like, there's the cautious way is to go... uh, If it's open... You go Breacher Boy with Dynamite and then either the Slasher Boy or Sniper Boy in a good position. <clears throat> or you go like those three. Or if you're like Aggro Suicide Man, you go Knob Dynamite, which I love seeing because it's my favorite thing to counter. But it, I mean, it is actually valid if someone's bunched up because the thing is, even if the board's d- more advantages, like unless the board has no heavy within like all the heavies within red of your drop zone so they can't forward deploy you actually always want to be the attacker against commandos so they can't deploy their last group against you because their last group is where all their forward deploys are going to be that's where all the sneaky gets are (laughs) yeah so at the moment that's the main problem because a lot of teams can't deal with that especially some of the newer teams because they were probably designed around that boy being at one or knowing how it's done probably no one using it against those teams. Yeah, I mean, right now the new buff is that you can have 11 activations on the commandos. Have you found that you're always doing that? Because I think these newer teams, the good melee operatives are, you know, there's plenty of them to fight against the commandos. So being able to scrap means that the commandos on turn one can really punch the Felgor and the Colts a li- before they ramp up, kind of, before yeah. they can get into position. And now Some having people... that 11th operative means that you can... Uh, that you can actually buy time against some of the other teams before you go in. Some people would say some foolish man contributed to uh, them getting 11 activations, but it might have been a mistake. I think it. the only time you don't take the two, because you have to take them together. You can't take them on their own. Um, I wouldn't take it against Phobos because they will literally just go, oh, is that the bomb squig? And they oh, I, I ignore obscuring, and then um, you just kill them. So you don't take the bomb squig against anyone who can ignore obscuring, uh, unless it's into the dark. But even into the dark, you have to be careful. But otherwise, you take them all the time. So probably it is going optional. To- it is optional. But you know, if you take the bomb squig, you can additionally select the commando grad. So you don't have. Oh, to it is the- optional. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's it then- can also select. So it is optional. Um, you don't have to take them together. But the issue is, yeah, I, I would never take the bomb squig against someone who ignores obscuring. It's just, yeah, I found that locally. Aerial. I found that area of play locally has been rough. So, because people will take the effort of sniping out the bomb squig, or you end up putting the bomb squig out in the open and just having it kind of yeah. get shot. Because you can just use it as like an ancillary uh, time waster. Like your opponent is going to shoot it if they can. And that means that they might open you up to a rocket boy on the other side of the map, getting a shot off on a character. Yep. So that might be worth it. I think the only thing you have to watch out for with the bomb squig is they can shush and then give it plus one APL so it can move, dash, and blow up. Like, uh, it's weird. I I think probably it shouldn't be able to get plus one APL via stupid. Like, just make it ignore all APL modifiers. But it's like, it, it's difficult to say. Um, but that's the thing you have to watch out for because they can move dash and then explode. So they technically have an 11, 11 inch threat range and it can be wider than you thought because it's on a 25 mil base. It's like when the guy skull, when it blows, when it flies and then moves an inch, it can actually hit a wide area of effect. Yeah. Um, it's about like a three inch bubble more, yeah. more than a two inch bubble. And on into the dark, it gets lethal five up. So it's technically a blast attack, which is fun but if you can catch a commando player positioning poorly you can blow it up and then on a free up it will kill everyone so you actually are incentivized to kill it because at least it's got like a 
one in three chance of not blowing up or blowing up around the commandos. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, the bomb squig has a rule where when it dies it, on a three or higher, it will blow up in its death spot. And if you're playing all in cursors, ignoring, you know, obscurity, you can catch the bomb because it has to be on an engage order. It's not allowed to c conceal because it's too stupid explicitly. Yeah. And that damn my aerial like you, you try hiding the aerial and someone will be able to get a shot like it's just so dumb. Are there any other niche tactics that you found have been particularly effective with commandos? Or you haven't really been on commandos in a while. How do you fight against the commandos? Niche well, it's tactics? like commandos. Like the only thing you need to remember about commandos, you, if they've got, if you haven't made them pop just a scratch, <clears throat> and you charge block them, they will fight you at the end of the turning point. So if they've got command points, don't charge them. Like, don't charge and pass because they will literally just go end of the turning point fight. Um, and the only thing, because they're kind of simple, because I played them for about two months and I know them inside and out. <clears throat> so the only thing you need to remember is they've got two sources of plus one APL. They're either going to burn you out like turning point one by doing all these suicide charges. Because of Shush, they actually become quite annoying depending on the board. But if you deploy in such ways where they can't safely move up or you can because they can only do shush once and i think they have to be in their deployment zone to do it to do that uh, free dash it is technically more than six inches from enemy operatives yeah or concealed so it doesn't have to be in your deployment it can be you know okay. basically anywhere but you can only use it once so depending on when players use it they can either play for turn one or on turn two end up in a much more spooky position yeah. But I don't uh, think I've ever seen a player wait for turn three or turn four for shush. But it's like the other thing, um, if they're taking shock tactics, it's usually an open board, so they need to kill someone turning point one, then control the most objectives turning point two. So what I've found is if you just don't engage them turning point one, they get really antsy to the point where they start doing suicide moves to bait you in. But the moment you stop that, you stop them from attack up point, and then as long as you can just tie them on the objectives turning point two, um, you can then, <clears throat> what do you call it, um, lock them out of two primaries. And the other thing is, you just have to control it. So if you're playing loot and they've looted objective and moved away, as long as you stay on their objective at the end of the turning point, you still control it. Or even if you stay on objectives they have uh, secured for an action point and you just end your move, like you end the turning point on, but actually haven't captured it, it you're still controlling it. You just haven't... Okay. Secure. That is true. So for our listeners yeah. who don't know, mission two secure. The way it is scored is at the end of the turn, you gain uh, victory points equal to the number of secured objectives. But secured objectives are not technically controlled. If you read it, it says yeah. that your objective is secured and it stays secured until you someone else secures it, which is different from mission three, which is capture, where you explicitly control it until someone else comes to control it. Yeah. So you, you can do sneaky things like that. Well, that's the things you have to watch out for against commandos. And that's pretty much it. The only thing you have to differentiate is, are they a high progressive turn one commando player? Or are they, are they trying to play the more like full sneaky, like full infiltration, just aiming to grind you down and win? But it's hard. Like the easiest thing, if they deploy free commandos on the conceal, you kind of know <laughs> what they're going to do. Um but you have to be careful because I had to redesign my maps because by the time this comes out, my Octarius maps will come up. Um, because, like, especially in Octarius, they can deploy on the oil pump. Like, they can deploy the sniper boy on the oil pump behind, like, the middle strut. So he's just safe because that all counts as heavy. So if you've positioned that poorly, he suddenly can shut down an entire drop zone. I've also um, seen a lot of players locally struggling against the rocket boy on conceal on turn one with uh sneaky git and being able to deploy a model against that or having a couple models you know you have a bait model and then you have two good gunners basically waiting for it to shoot and then counter punch it is important yeah i think if you've got enough operatives to spare like oddly vet guard are one of the best counters to commanders because they'll just go okay here's here's my two guardsmen on opposite corners are you going to shoot one of them with your rocket boy are you not well here's a crack and a frag right it's like they don't care because the moment they've killed that like it's gone even elites don't care to an extent 
because they can deploy out of its range and just punish. But it's it's the commanders are weird. They're more of a shooty team than a melee team. So you actually have to keep that in mind. The reason people think they the reason they were good into Felgals is because they could outshoot Felgals. The reason they're good into or actually statistically, Colts is one of their worst matchups. Because uh, once the Colts get the torments, the torments just shred through all the boys. I think locally on open, we've seen probably the opposite in New York, where because of the turn one, you can have three good melee object melee models into the Colts on turn one. It can be really hard for Colts to actually even get to the point where the torments are very dangerous. Uh, so the way I played the round that was I would turning point one pop the minus one to hit, and just like anyone that would charge could charge boys, uh, would charge um, cultists, right? So then you just charge your dark commune in, they're minus one to hit, you charge in guys and just start mutating everyone. So commando players quickly stopped doing that here because you would let them only be able to charge um, cultists and they would kill a cultist and then they would just get swarmed and all of a sudden like these like these one to two lone commandos would just be spawning mutants everywhere. And then turning point two, they're just dead. So because like once you've got three torments on the board, it's game over for commandos. Because yeah, all you have to do is saying. you run through their guns and they have nothing left. Because the greatest thing is that stupid psyker can shoot people in combat. So it's like chip, 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 and then it's like a oh, shotgun psyker in the face. Yeah, that's, I, think, that's... I think I think post nerf that matchup looks um, even better. I think for col- or commandos compared to where the cultists were because now the injury bubbles aren't working. Uh Yes, but the the issue they will have now is just if the cultist player is smarter, they can still do the same thing. It just takes more work because they would just have to like turning point one ban, banner pops uh, minus one damage on everyone and then do it. But like, yeah, the thing about commanders, they actually don't like combat. Uh, they don't like combat and AP weapons. So uh, what is it? The reason they hate intercession is because you go p- um, piercing bolt guns. And you take uh, better melee operatives because your guys will double fight. And you can actually kill commandos, uh, two commandos per combat if you're very efficient, especially if you invest, even like you can invest in the Assault Doctrine or just invest in CP rerolls. Or even Dueler. Yeah, Dueler as well. Like Dueler messes commandos up because they only have four attacks. Yeah, yeah. Having five attacks versus four attacks. It's like that was the original part of them being not that great because in the old meta when there were tons of intercessions and legionaries they were the soft counter to commandos and if you forward deployed those three the space marines would still run up and slap those those three guys and reliably kill them i mean if you're terrified of commandos just go legionary and and commando players will despise your life forever they they can't chew through nurgle like they just can't yeah three five is just not enough damage yep and it's like um so if you went Chosen and you went, what was it? Chosen, Laughing Psyker. Uh, anointed. An, anointed and uh, Shrive Talon. Those four operatives will probably wipe the team because then you still have the Plasma Gun and then you have like the Heavy Bolter and you have effectively muted that entire team. Because even a Dynamite actually won't kill you. Uh, no, not a Dynamite, sorry. The Bomb Squig won't kill you. So like it's just... So th- that's why I think commandos are very powerful now. But it's like once the elite players start coming back, then commandos will start going, oh, this is stupid. Why do we only have four attacks? Because um, I think people don't realize how many, or how often it is to roll only two hits with four dice hitting on threes. Right? It's just... and they Yeah, have four no- dice is just not that reliable. Even on twos, like I've rolled two hits yeah. on four dice a lot <laughs> hitting on twos. Well, it's like, so the big thing about commandos, they have Daka, 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 which turns a crit. If you roll a crit, you can turn a miss into a hit. But for combat, if they roll no... Two hits. Two, two hits, hits. They can turn can one of those into a crit. Mm-hmm. But they actually have no way to proc extra hits in combat, only in shooting. So the more you just tie them down and outfight them, they actually don't know what to do. Like, they hate gene stealers because gene stealers outfight them. So it's kind of the weird thing. Like, uh, even Galapox messed them up. Galapox are huge into messing them up. Although, yeah. no, maybe not current Galapox. I think yeah. current Galapox are kind of crap. Oh, yeah? 
Maybe we should switch into hot takes right now. It sounds yeah, like we're running out of credit. It. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> All right, Geller Pox. <laughs> the crowd of well, crap. Uh, because um, rust, what do you call it? Rust, rust emanations. emanations. Regardless. Yeah. Only triggers off the big guys now and they have to be in engagement range. I am not terrified of that kill team anymore. I will walk within two inches of your face and shoot you and laugh. I don't care if I'm minus one dice anymore. I'm not minus one to hit anymore. Like that is hugely different. And now you can just punt the mutants and the glitchlings without caring. Like, yeah, they've, they've made the four nightmare hulks have to do probably like 80% of the work now, whereas before yeah. they could do probably like 60% of the work and yep. the team would still be good. Now those four operatives, if they don't do enough, the team definitely is much less powerful, which I'm looking forward to because yes. Yeah, they were they were very powerful. I think at New Mexico when we were watching Orion play against Ace, oh, we we're like, oh man, on. you could just play security and turn on injury bubble and force your opponent to come yeah. to you. Which is a very powerful combination. Yeah, and it was like so Ace did 18 damage with his um because you could take three gunners at the time with his hunter clade. So the long rifle, right? And I was like, oh, interesting. Because I walked by at the time. Orion made 15 <laughs> saves out of 18. And I think he broke Ace. <laughs> I think Ace just shut down after that. <laughs> and then it was just like, nothing you can do. I hate five up DPRs. Um, but yeah, I think a Hunter Clade, uh, not Hunter Clade, sorry. Uh, I don't think Warp Co not Warp Coven. I don't think... Uh, the team we were talking about. Geller Fox, <laughs> Geller Fox. Geller Fox. Yeah. I think that's this is probably their death now. It might have been too far, but I think when they've been at a 60% win rate for six months, I think they deserve it. Yeah. I think getting a little bit of a trim would be fine. Yeah. Harlequins. Oh, sorry. I've got a terrible cough. Terrible. <laughs> Craig Rex, just in there, tickling the uvula, huh? Any other spicy takes? You know, uh, maybe some other teams that people are sleeping on. I don't know. I saw that Spain had the Hearthkin Salvagers at an A tier on their recent tier list. Maybe, right? Oh gosh, I think they're good on open, but not on Into the Dark. So on a mixed overall, that brings them down. Um, I still think Legionary are in the perfect position to take them out. I think everyone, because uh, they do. Really well into cults now. Cults can't trade a torment into a like before a torment would kill a legionnaire. Now a 100%. torment will not kill a legionnaire. I would be terrified charging a torment or being charged by a legionnaire as a torment. Like that that terrifies me. Um what is it? I, I think Inquisition are still just in A tier, like they're almost S tier still. Like you basically go only navy now. You only go navy. Uh, because you get 12 activations and like, you know, if you take the Grenadier, he gives you five extra equipment points. So, like, oh, sure. Yeah. Wait, I think he still, he still strips away the, your Kraken frag, but at least you still have yeah. access to them. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is with that kill team is like, the reason I said um, absolute authority should be once per game is because now it doesn't work against zero CP stratagems or once you play for free. So like now Hyra Tech can play the game. But because it can be used on any strat, it just can't be used on more than once. It's just like the reason I can't play Hand of the Archon at the moment is because the turning point one, they will turn off either Dens into the Dark so they can destroy me in the drop zone or Fleet of Foot so I can't contest the objectives. And then turning point two, they'll turn off uh, from Darkness Death so it kills my aggro. Phobos, they turn off Vanguard and then they turn off uh, Bolter Draw turning point two and laugh at you. So they, they've, it's, that matchup is entirely unchanged. Um, like it's so bad, it has forced Phobos players to take six Reavers. Like I'm not even joking. Their tactic is to go Reaver Sergeant and five Reavers. So if they turn off double shoot, I can charge fight shoot. So even if they turn off double fight, I, I'm still shooting with an AP one uh, bolt pistol. And I'm like, that is entirely not how this team should be played. But that's how it's being forced. And like even Hyrotech, right? They they will turn off your March turning point one, so you can't move up. And then they'll just turn off your rerolls, turning point two. So you still lose a ton of your like tempo. And there's, I think, a lot of teams people are still unrealizing like how powerful just turning off any strap per turn. Like a, a, a misguided Harlequin player going, oh, I'm going to deploy like three of my guys on engage, and then I'm going to domino field, and then they just go no. And it's like 
you've lost the game. So there's it's it I don't know. Like there's so many teams Inquisition still check just because absolute authority isn't once per game. And I think people are in for a rude awake awakening when the players who know how to manipulate it suddenly start doing well with them still. Because I yeah. think the I think right, thing some up until now the Inquisition just hasn't really been seeing that much play across the board. Is is it what it looked like first locally. Month. Yeah. Yeah. because uh, they're they're a hard team to play. But the issue is if you know how to play them, they're dumb. And that's they were dumb. The first they're one. less they're less dumb right now where they're you less can't just dumb. have five AP two guns. What's the the problem is now people have to think more and people don't like thinking. Right? It's just like oh my brain. It's the working. wrinkles. I can feel no. the wrinkle. Synergy. Oh, I'll just take five witch blades. That's all I need. Um, I think we'll have a hot takes. Um, maybe exaction being good in the meta. They can be, but they're a really difficult team to play because, like, the issue is, I think they're the only kill team in the game that has a different kill team for every opponent. And also for every board and mission. Because if you're playing Into the Dark, you take no long range stuff. If you're playing on an open board that has fire lanes, maybe you take the long range stuff. And then it's like the mix of shields and shotguns. There's no definitive right answer. Because like the thing that <laughs> makes me sad is I see people online going, <clears throat> what's the perfect one box team for like exaction? What's the perfect kill team? I was like, no, there's there's no perfect team. It like literally changes every game and i i do think they have play it's just gonna be hard to do if that makes sense yeah i think everyone I, seems i i place them like pretty pretty high if you can do everything right because there is a lot that can go wrong with eight wounds yes. well, it's like that's why when it comes to my tier list like generalize it the only exception i ever made was for inquisition but it's like they're like a more complex inquisition so Technically, they should do well into the current meta. It's just how well... Like, it, it depends on what happens with elites. Elites are the big factor of the meta. So, um, if elites come back, like, it would hurt commandos and exaction. But more so commandos, I would feel. I think I think commandos would get hurt more. I feel like, looking at the tools that exaction have gotten, yeah. their elite matchup has gotten way more approachable, where it was, like, an impossible before. Yeah, it's not... Like, the funniest thing, I was seeing exaction players go, like, want ap1 shotguns and i was like wow you do realize you have eliminated their only bad matchup and now made their good matchups amazing so piercing's a nice compromise situational piercing because it was just tiring re reading like exaction players go i need ap1 shotguns i was like yes you need shotguns that are hit on freeze 4-4 ap1 that can also ignore all terrain and get rebels that's what your kill team needs yes uh oh another hot take pathfinder still suck on into the dark. Oh, <laughs> on into the dark. I think Pathfinders at least seem interesting on into the dark. I haven't played them yet, yeah. so I no, I no. It's see. like if I had nine months to play out this new change, I would probably go. Oh, in nine months, I could probably figure something out. You give me a month before season three comes out, basically, or two months. What, what am I going to do with that? There are already so so many events refusing to use into the dark anymore. So it's like if this came uh, with. If this had come at Q2 when Shadow the Vaults. got dropped. If it yeah. came out with Shadow Vaults, yeah, I would have gone, oh, actually, then we can actually see. It's like, <laughs> it's like buffing, I don't know, yeah, giving Phobos all their buffs just as season one finishes. And then we immediately start in like to Into the Dark. Like they were like, oh, you get like unlimited Bolter Drill, unlimited rerolls as long as someone is more than six away. Oh, by the way, we're playing in a match where like everyone is within six inches. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh oh, uh, I think they're interesting, right? But it's it's only on open where they're probably like might be too good on open. But it's just yeah, that I think on open pathfinders have never been bad. Just because being able to ignore all of the shooting rules is just an innately very powerful <laughs> skill set. And then well, in the dark, they struggled a lot. Well, it's like the my biggest hot take is Kaon still sucks. Montcar is still the best, especially like people were telling me, oh, but John on loot, I could Kaon. And pop and do mission action and pop all the points. I was like, yeah, but did you realize we can now pop a point every turn? And they were like, what? What is the point of me suiciding onto a point to pop it 
when my opponent can kill me and then do it the next turn. Because uh, another hot take, people don't know how to play loot. Everyone I've played against on loot, basically, has gone like, I'm going to alpha the points. And I'm like, great. You keep doing that. You keep running I, yeah. onto my points. I think the change to four loots a turn or four loots per point has meant that you really don't need to suicide points because you can always catch back up if you punish people early on. And that's but definitely everyone a, a still thing. does. Everyone's yes. they see the points and they just go, I know how to play Lou. <laughs> I'm gonna run at you. And I'm like, Yeah, you do that. It's great. Yeah, the adaptation the adaptation to loot now that there are four points. I think someone mentioned a while back, I think Strom might have mentioned maybe four or five podcasts ago, that the change to loot is going to make things a little bit stallier. And I don't think I've seen it because I don't think people have really adjusted to it. But I think you're right that you should not play loot as a blitz match now because there's no reason to. Now, if your opponent goes up and grabs a point, you're like, all right, fine. If you go and stop them from getting control, the next turn they can't do it, you fight them on the point and then you can claim it. Like yeah. that's, totally, that's a totally valid line of play that you should probably be aiming for. And if someone goes 4-2 on you on turn one, you can easily swing it back to 3-3, three, 4-2 three, the next turn if your opponent's too aggressive. Yeah, it's like, it's just funny. I had a Wormblade guy who didn't cheat, which is a important thing, who just like suicided the points. It was like, yeah, I've got four loot turning point one. And I was like, great. And then I flipped it and got four his turn and then just grinded, grinded him out. And he was like, oh, Oh, if we were playing old loot, I would have won. I was like, yeah, you would have won on old loot, but this is new loot. Get used to it. Yeah, so. I think uh, an, an important skill set for anyone who's trying to practice a sweater kit. Got to make sure that you adjust your priors when you play and rules have been changed. Oh, if you're really sweaty, you can bait your opponent into being aggressive. You know, you just go like, oh, I'm going to measure that. I'm nine inches away. I'm going to give him plus one APL. It's your closer objective. And then they alpha it and you go, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think I've actually done something like that as a juke with recover item. I'll like pre-measure on one side of the board. People yeah. will like think about it and then I'll just place on the other side. I'm like, it's just a measure. Oh, that's, that's what you always do with recover item. So oh, are there any other hot takes? I'm sh- non-controversial hot take. Uh... I think as far as the teams go, I'm pretty happy with where the balance is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would tweak about this mirror is just commandos. I mean, Chaos Cults still need nerfs. But you think? We'll have to... Yeah, the only nerf I would make is um, devotees have to kill to mutate. And I think that's the only other change they need. Mm. Because I've had people tell me it's impossible. And then I've shown them it's very possible, right? All you have to do is just think and set it up. Instead of just going YOLO charge, slap someone and go, oh, I can never kill anyone. Uh, like I had so much Chaos Cult tech. Like I would actually give someone a blade and um, use them to protect the Icon Arc. So if they got too close to an Icon Arc, they would fight a cultist with 4-5 damage. Um, but they'd, like, there's ways around it. And then I think Commandos, the best blanket nerf for them is they lose the Grot and Squig. And sneaky gear is capped to one once per game. That's probably all they need. Yeah. Because I think the problem that that's exasper- exasperated commandos is people have been designing very, very unfun boards, right? Unfun boards. Yeah. I mean, there are certain regions where players, I think, were designing around Pathfinders at one point or another and commandos at the same time because there's a lot of turn one pressure. And I mean, in some regions, there's also a lot more heavy in deployments, I think. Well, there was a certain... Like, everyone thought I was talking about Tacoma. Like, Tacoma had ASOS layout, right? There was a tournament that might have been closer to home, which had no cover in the drop zones, or maybe a barrel, right? Everything was an inch out of cover, so you actually couldn't get much cover. Or there was light cover with a vantage point mysteriously within six inches of your drop zone, or seven inches. Right, just just close enough for certain kill teams, right? Uh, and that tournament has now made people go: if they ever use that terrain again, they are not playing. So, those are the kind of drop zones I've seen. Like, you know, uh, but please never put a vantage point in the drop zone. We are we are not one month into the game anymore. There is no need no need for that kind of stuff, right? We have learned. 
a lot in these two years. These two years. Yeah, I mean, I'll put an advantage in the drop zone as long as I have enough heavy in the mid board to cover up. For oh yeah, if you're playing a board yeah. with like eight pieces Just, of heavy, it doesn't matter. But yeah. when you've only got five pieces and two of them are in the drop zones it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's too much it just makes it actually impossible for you to get uh fun setups it just oh that's too much turn that's the tent this is a spicy hot take uh most people don't know how to design boards still who's your uh all right fine let's amp it up who's your who's your number one board designer outside of yourself oh okay hmm Oh, I know. Um, the Warhammer World team. They, I know a lot of people, like the funniest thing, people like their boards are too dense. But, because I, I talked to them a lot about board design philosophy and they opened my eyes because they were like, oh, instead of just designing one board to be like, maybe get like closer to a vantage point, how about one side is more dense, but it's actually harder to get to the objectives. Where this object, where this side of the board, it's not as easy to like alpha from, but you have much a more easier way to move up the board. So they've actually opened my mind for like designing boards where movement is more important than getting position for kills. So like it makes being the defender very important. And they also play on denser boards because I think the common misconception is people think you can play a playable game outside of the box. Even Octarius is like just not enough. Like it's like 90% there. So the issue is obviously at Warhammer World, they can like build huge boards but the level of boards is what they expect, like what Games Workshop expect you to play on in general, which is a lot, which is why I, I like, you know, say if you can build a board like Warhammer World, you should. But if you're a TO, maybe not go with like map packs that tell you how to build from a box. Just be aware, like playing Chownath, um, Morok and Nakamund from a single box is going to be very, very difficult to play balancedly. That makes sense. That does make a lot of sense. So it sounds like we're winding down. Is there anything that you want to call out before Ooh. we uh, split for the day? Uh, so I would have oh, oh, I would have just done a terrain video tomorrow, so I'm posting my nine new Octarius maps, but I will shout out some events. So if you haven't already, I mean, I don't think this is going to be possible, but you've got Warhammer World uh, the week before Nova. So if you're in the UK... And you don't know... I, yeah, we've got time. It's a golden ticket event. Uh, then we've got uh, the New York Open in New York in yeah. November, which will be golden. And you should go because it'll be fun. I've actually convinced one of my locals who used to be in New York, who's now in London, I think he's going to go. I should be going. There may be some kind of video about that. And uh, LVO, LVO 2024, I'll shout out that. I'm going there, Dakota and his crew, that's going to be balling. It's going to be at the Rio, that's the only problem about the event, the Rio, not not, not LVO, it's just... It's just a good off, thing of, off strip. Well, uh, it's more like it's off time, it's like in, from the 80s. The, the greatest thing about the Rio is the Penn and Teller Theatre, So because I went to see Penn and Teller last time, that was great, honestly, so good. Um, but uh, that LVO should be really fun. I think last time we had 84 players from 100 because 100 bought tickets and then died, like got lost on the way to New Mexico. I mean, not New Mexico, you know, LVO. Uh, but LVO should be fun. I think that American events in general have been doing really good because UK events have been kind of meandering in terms of attendance and regularity. Whereas like all your major, like not even like majors, but like all your American con events have just been huge, which is really good. Because what is it? Nova was 48 last year. It's now 64. I think uh, it 72. I think oh, they, cool. they added some extra tickets and they almost sold out again. So I think I think it got pushed mm. up a little bit. Because I know uh, what else? Adepticon had a huge attendance. Um, like all your cons have been doing really well. I think Goonhammer has... Got 22, 20, well, I assume we'll be down to 20, and it'll be like the first time we're trying it, and we're extremely close to Nova. So cool. that's definitely, I think that definitely has hurt on some level. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, you guys have been doing great for events. So yeah, and I you, shall. You have a tournament world. coming up soon, right? Oh, yeah, I should be doing a narrative tournament in London 
we're just ironing out the dates and then I want to do a competitive tournament, but I'm probably going to leave it to the new year because season three is coming sometime. And I think if I plan an event now, it's going to be difficult, especially if everything changes. So, yeah, I, we don't, I, don't, I don't really know what's coming down the line, but I am looking forward to it. I, I hope and did, don't hope it's jungle because I've been memeing jungle, right? And if it actually turns out to be jungle, like everyone is just going to 100% think I'm now a playtester. And it's just like, there's nothing. I want the jungle because of the memes. But then I'm also like, now everyone will just think you're leaking stuff. And it's like, no. I lose either way, right? I either don't get my jungle and get upset or I get my jungle and I just get... Someone programmed their bot to say every time I mentioned, just to say John is a great playtester who contributes a lot to this community. I was like, damn it. So what's your, uh, what's your keyword for any listeners who want to get a Just Another Kill Team gauge from our sponsor? Critalicious. Critalicious. Yeah. All right. You heard it here, folks. Critalicious. <laughs> There it is, friends. Thanks for listening. You made it to the end. Congratulations. Crit delicious. Thanks again, John, for coming on. Yeah, thanks, and you roll a crit. Yeah. I'm just another 